Hey everyone! <laughs> so I kind of started almost on time today. <laughs> Thanks for uh, everyone that's come in and uh, Happy New Year if you weren't in our last live stream. But uh, yeah, it's 2020. Um, <laughs> I tell you, I just can't believe how time flies. I was uh, looking at my oh my microphone. I'm sorry. It's way out, isn't it? <laughs> Let me put this here. Okay, now we're good. So, uh, just to confirm, can uh, can everybody see and hear me at this point? Do I have audio? Hi, Serge. How are you? John, always good to see you. <laughs> uh, both Johns, actually. Wow. And Jack? Uh, wow, I don't recall. Your name looks familiar, but I'm not sure. I think you've been here all... All, all the time. Anyway, hi Andy, how are you? <laughs> oh, hey John, so you got your E1. Uh, yeah, the, the, you know, Olympus has been making great cameras for a very long time. I mean, I don't know what their first Micro Four Thirds one was, but I imagine it was, it was a Model 1, right? An E1 or something like that. Uh, Hey, Happy New Year, Paulo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, the, the SD, John is saying, be very careful with the SD cards. Um, I was just watching a uh, video by uh, uh, from Salanto blog uh, by Maddie, and uh, he, uh, hi, hi, Stan, hi, Andreas. Uh, he was talking about how fragile the, the little pins are, you know, along the SD card right in here. And I, yeah, they should get rid of that. I think he was saying that the Sony uh, tough cards, they got rid of these little fine pins that are right along here. And uh, thank you, Serge. Um, and, uh, they also got rid of this little uh, right protect thing here, which is a great idea. I mean, I think these are kind of legacy things that don't need to be there anymore. I've had these fine pins break on me a lot myself. Um, well, not a lot, but I have a couple of cards that, you know, the pins are pretty much gone. The little plastic th uh, ribs here, not the pins themselves. Uh... Oh, you're, yeah, I missed your earlier, uh, hi, John, I can't scroll up that far, I might have been before the stream started, uh, but I think you did mention something about that in one of the comments, because someone else was talking about that, that might have been you. Um, and it, it happened to me once in another camera, and I used a uh, dental tool pick to kind of reach in there and pull it out. <laughs> Uh, and I was I was able to save the camera, but um, yeah, it's it's a pain if if one of these break and you know <laughs> you know another funny thing is you don't know how many times I've I've found one of these in the dryer or washing machine <laughs> at the bottom after I'm doing laundry. Oh, I found uh, I found one of my 128 gig cards uh, a couple months back. I was like I was wondering where that thing went, and then uh, I found it in the dryer. So it's amazing how durable they are on one hand, but on the other hand, uh, they're very fragile too. So um, these ST, SD cards, but in terms of uh, cards going bad, I think I've only had one card out of about 20 go bad uh, on my case. And that, that one card that went bad was really old. It wasn't... It wasn't even a card that I bought. It was one that came with uh, some old camera I bought years ago. Oh, excuse me. So, um, yeah, hopefully Olympus can fix that for you, John. It's it's probably just, just got jammed in there, and they just need to, you know, pull it out with a pick or something. Um <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, let's see. Um, as always, you know the live streams are always about. Uh, you know, I'm here to answer and support any questions about Olympus cameras, lenses, uh, Olympus workspace, 
and uh you know and then just just to hang out with you guys you know with like-minded individuals who enjoy uh you know photography in general regardless of camera brand uh, i just happen to you know be in love with olympus and but i, I have several other cameras too as, as many of you know um let's see so uh Patrick saying, hi, Rob, I just got a pen app for Christmas and I'm loving the monochrome mode watching all of your older tutorials about it. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that pen app, I took it out the other day myself because someone wanted me to compare. I think it was Solar Body. She wanted me to compare, may, maybe someone else, to compare the Fujifilm uh, Acros um, versus the Olympus monochrome profile number two. And uh, man, I totally bombed that. That I, I seriously, I, I I went out vlogging at least twice this week, and both of them were total fails. Uh, I I may post one. It's 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 got a little bit of content in it that might be interesting, but for the most part, they they sucked. But as far as comparing the monochrome profile number two versus the Acros. Uh, monochrome profile number two is definitely more contrasty and uh, you know so it's it's pushing the highlights and crushing the shadows a little bit more than the acros and the acros also uh, pushes the midtones a little bit and another thing I noticed about acros is that it does have a very fine grain to it that I didn't notice before um, when I was pixel peeping, there's a very fine grain in Acros. And to so to imitate that on our Olympus cameras, I had set up a highlight shadow profile uh, that I shared in my last live stream. But also uh, you need to add a fine grain. There's three grain settings on the Pen F, low, medium, high. If you set it to low plus those highlight shadow settings I, I talked about, uh, you can pretty much duplicate the Acros setting. And Acros I also noticed uh, tends to sharpen a little bit as well uh, very subtly uh, there's a little bit of sharpening in there too that you may want to crank a little bit of sharpening on the pen out that's if you want to duplicate the uh, Fujifilm cameras Acros and the reverse is true I think you could easily duplicate monochrome profile number two on the Fujifilm with you know tweaking it but most of my viewers are not Fujifilm users, so I don't think anybody would care if I converted Pan F Monochrome Profile 2 to Fujifilm. Um, hi, Plato. Hi, Queenie. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, and uh, Queenie, you're relatively new. Uh, a viewer here on the channel or participant in the live stream I think so welcome back I appreciate that um, I, I really well, like I was saying I was really trying to uh, crank out a couple of vlogs this week because the weather's been relatively mild you know low 50s high 40 degree you know certainly well above freezing in terms of Celsius whatever that is oh my god and the other thing that's happened since last week is uh, I upgraded my SSD drive in my computer from a 256 gig SATA to a um, uh, one terabyte NVMe drive. <clears throat> uh, just because I kept I kept running out of space on my scratch drive uh, when I was doing some processing for video, but. That's neither here nor there. What happened is I had a two terabyte drive, working drive, that had everything from 2019 on there. Ugh. And I don't know how it happened. I must have spiked the power when I was taking the drive out of the laptop because the drive is dead. So I lost everything I did in 2019. You know, my entire you know, photo catalog, videos, everything. Uh, but thankfully, <clears throat> I do have a backup, but it was three weeks old. So I lost the last three weeks of 2019, uh, except what I could recover from, you know, my memory cards laying around. 
that I've been using, you know, in December. Um, and that, that's another reason I haven't vlogged or cranked out too much this week is because I've been trying to recover files and organizing all of my backups. Uh, so that, you know, that's really something that everyone, as you start to develop a catalog over the years, um, you know, try to develop some methodology for backing up and keeping duplicates, whether it's on the cloud or uh, on multiple hard drives, because I have, God, I have about seven or eight hard drives that uh, I rotate around and try to make sure I have two copies of everything. And, uh, man, yes, Serge, so the online backup, um, it, I, I thought about that. I do have a, a pro Flickr account. I'm a pro member, so I can upload all of my JPEGs. I haven't tried the uh, raw files. And, you know, for like 50 bucks a year, you can get unlimited storage on uh, Flickr. So I'm thinking about trying to organize that to some extent. But, you know, the, the problem with cloud systems is, you know, if Flickr... Uh, you know, decides to stop doing it or changes their terms of service or something, you know, I could lose all of that just as easily. And, and that's really true for any cloud backup system, whether it's Amazon or Google or Microsoft. They all have these cloud storage solutions that I get a little bit antsy when I rely on that as a backup solution because who knows in five years if if any one of those will be around. Uh, the likelihood is is pretty high that they'll still be around, but uh, so it, and, you know it's just it's just something that I I have a little I struggle with depending on a third party and paying for it, uh, and then finding out that they don't want to do it anymore, and then I'm back to backing up internally to my own hard drives, and my my buddy Walter, man he he keeps uh, hard drive backups at home and he keeps duplicates at his office so he has you know for example if my house burned down i would lose everything uh, except what i have a little bit on the cloud uh, at least if his house burns down you know all of his photos are backed up on drives at his office and um and then there's you know vice versa if his office burns down you know he'll be okay because he has his backups at home so it can get pretty, uh, there, there needs to be some methodology for doing backups. Uh, and I, I assume there's, there's channels out there that explain how to do backups like in a very logical way um, with respect to, for the average person, because the few videos I saw on doing backups and things, Man, they get uh, they get carried away and very technical, which I can follow along to some extent because I have that background. But I, I man, I just can't imagine, like you know, the average person, photographer, creative person that uh, doesn't have any technical background, you know, or very little, being able to follow you know those backup solutions. Um, because you know there there's there's raid drives where you you can set up four drives and <clears throat> you know have them all back up against each other and then you have and the problem with raid drives if if one gets corrupt the others get corrupt right because they're all duplicates uh, and then the other challenge is like with cloud storage you know what's the long term solution you know smug mug or Google drive or microsoft etc i i didn't want this to become a backup solution live stream but i just i did that that is the the challenge i ran into this week is i i have all of these backups and and once a year i do try to organize those but i keep finding uh you know i just i get i get disorganized i i try to label my discs you know, like this is 2013, 14, and 15, and then, 
and I know that this is this is version this is the second backup this is not the prime the primary backup I have on another drive this is the second backup um, but like I was saying if my house burns down all of it's gone so a cloud backup solution would save that but anyhow um, uh, so yeah Arthur Arthur's saying he lost a two terabyte drive Wow, that's uh, that's quite a coincidence, Arthur. You lost a two terabyte drive the same time I did, doing the same thing, upgrading to an NVMe drive. What a coincidence, man! Great minds think alike and have the same bad luck too. Apparently, I just can't believe I spiked that drive. I made sure the power was off on the laptop before I took it out. And what I was thinking of doing is buying the same two terabyte drive. It's still available locally here and pulling the uh controller board off of that one you know swapping controller boards on it and see if that'll save it because sometimes that you know that's a little trick is if you can if you got a dead drive sometimes it's just the controller board and if you find the same exact drive that is working you can swap the controller board and recover this stuff uh, off that drive uh, but anyhow, um, I'm thinking about doing that, but that's, you know, it's like $90 for that, for another drive. I don't know if it's worth $90 to save those last three weeks of 2019. Because uh, the only pictures I care about, there was a couple that were during Christmas that I do have the JPEGs, which is fine, I guess. I, I lost all the raw files, though. Um... John Luke, if you don't have three backups, you don't, you have none. That's so true. Uh, good night, Rod. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll catch you tomorrow. I'll have to do a live stream at a different time slot because I know there's a lot of people in Rod's situation, and I, I say that every week. I, I better deliver on that, right? Do a live stream and at a different time, you know, like a twelve hours from now. Um. So Chuck is saying, some M.2 drives protect the content if removed from the computer. Are you sure? Uh, well, the drive that died was not an M.2. It was a, it was a SATA drive. Which, um, <clears throat> you know, is an actual hard drive, this one. Well, not this one. This one died, too. For no reason. Uh, anyway... It was one of these, you know, physical drive. Um, yeah, Michael, I'm with you. You don't want to have your picks on the cloud either, right? I'm, I'm a little weary of that as a long-term solution or as part of a long-term solution. I think it's a good... Uh, like last resort solution like if you lose everything then as a last resort hopefully the cloud is still there yeah off-site backup that would be that would be the ideal thing you know fortunately i mean other if if i can get all of my jpegs at least off onto the cloud that that would be the best i can do off-site um I need to disconnect the battery. Yeah, you're probably right about that, but the battery on this laptop it looked like it was soldered in. It doesn't look like it's replaceable. Um Yeah, I I should have I I I should have been more careful. <sighs> Robert, uh, Robert, uh, Peteru is asking, what do I use for viewing raw photos? Uh, 
for for just my general photography, I just use Olympus Workspace. Um, the reason you see noise in the raw photos in other uh, uh, <laughs> photo editing software is they're actually trying to draw the raw photo or or um, man my my brain is not working today uh, the the raw editors like Lightroom and Capture One and all these other raw editors are generating their own uh, view of the raw image um, which includes all of the noise Olympus Workspace it looks like they are pulling from the embedded JPEG uh, and applying uh, noise reduction on the raw file itself uh, so as in, as the settings are from the from the camera so I've noticed that the raw files that you see on Olympus workspace don't show as much noise and then and, and it's clearly because they are processing that raw file slightly before you actually see it on the computer but the noise is there It's just it's just being masked by by workspace to some extent. Fireproof safe <laughs> to store external drives at home. Yeah, I I do have a fireproof safe. I should put my drives in there, but um I need a bigger safe. I just have a little one. <laughs> do I need a... Okay, Omega Loopy is asking, do I need a UV filter for my Lumix 25 F18 to avoid purple fringing? I saw an article from Alan Watts and Forrester about this issue on Olympus cameras, wondering if the filters... No. The uh, UV filter does not reduce purple fringing as far as I know the uh, the reason the Lumix cameras Lumix lens is showing purple fringing on Olympus cameras because Olympus does not do the lens corrections or does not have that lens profile in their camera so uh, it doesn't correct a lot of the imperfections that are found in lenses so when you put that same lens though on a, on a Panasonic body you should see less purple fringing and less lens distortion and, and less vignetting and any, any other, uh, less diffraction possibly, any other sort of lens uh, imperfections are reduced greatly by using the same manufactured lens with the same manufactured camera. So Panasonic on Panasonic and Olympus on Olympus. And when you cross those two things, that's when you start to see the actual imperfections from the lenses uh, because there's, they're apparently they're not sharing their lens databases with each other. Um, so yeah, don't don't buy a UV filter for to reduce purple flaring. UV filters, the only use for them now is to you know protect the front element of the lens. Uh, so buy a high quality one if you get one so that you don't get any uh, uh, image image degradation and that it actually does block UV. Now UV doesn't affect our digital cameras because digital cameras have their own UV blocking filters on the sensor already. So that's another reason it, it won't make any difference. Uh, Seagate, yeah I haven't had good luck with Seagate but I keep buying them because they're cheaper but anyhow <laughs> So Arthur was saying his Seagate drives, he was not getting good support, et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've had much better luck with Western Digital, but never, Seagate, I've always had problems. And the ir ironic thing is Western Digital, I think, owns Seagate. Yeah, there's a ribbon cable you can disconnect. Yeah, the battery had some... The the ribbon cable in my laptop battery is what Patrick's referring to. It did have some wiggle on it, so I assume it looked like it was removable. But yeah, I just didn't take that step. I didn't explore it uh, as much as I wanted to. 
because uh, you know what would be worse than losing that two terabyte hard drive is losing the laptop itself and doing something that spikes the motherboard and now I got a dead laptop and a dead hard drive um, I mean a hard drive should be a you know a relatively simple task and it shouldn't be it shouldn't anyway I should have been more careful because you know it's winter time so the air is very dry and there's a lot of static electricity too that's that you have to deal with oh jean Luc is saying if the drive is simply corrupted it's not corrupted it just won't even spin up so i think what happened is the <clears throat> on the main board itself i spiked one of the, the diodes or something that you know uh, regulates the power or the direction of power in there and uh so one of the you know one of the diodes or capacitors were spiked either via static electricity or from the action of removing the ribbon cable off of here and somehow i crossed the pin uh Anyhow, <clears throat> but I've, I've used PhotoRec before. It's awesome. I've used it mostly on my uh, SD cards. Yeah, Thomas is saying he loves the 25 millimeter and purple fringing is fixed in uh, post-processing software. Just about all of them have some form of uh, purple fringing uh, correction. And Arthur's saying he loves DxO, how it renders raw files, how it uh, has its own lens correction profiles. That's good because, you know, Lightroom does not have lens correction profiles for the lenses uh, for Micro Four Thirds because it assumes that the camera has the lens profile and just that it's already built in. And I, I believe, I have to test for it, but I believe the when you put a Panasonic lens on an Olympus body or vice versa, it will correct for distortion uh, for those, you know, particularly wide angle lenses, but I, I haven't tested for that and looked for it specifically. Yeah, I know, Arthur, we did the same thing at the same time. Uh, Omega Pi is saying, so the Zwicko 25 is notably better than the Lumix. Yes, I would say it is. Um, uh, in, a, in a lot of respects now particularly the autofocus now I'll tell you that uh, the EM5 Mark III EM1 Mark II uh, has pretty much overcome any autofocusing issues I used to have with my Panasonic lenses uh, maybe because it's phase detect or something but it's a lot better now but Previously, yeah, I didn't use that Panasonic 25 millimeter much, uh, and I ended up buying a 25 millimeter Olympus lens. But now that um, the M5 Mark III, M1 Mark II have this great autofocusing, I'm, I'm thinking about taking out and using it more. The only challenge I have is. Um, because the, the Olympus 25 millimeter from Lumix, the 1.7, is fantastically sharp. Great contrast, get great color. I mean, it's a wonderful lens for general photography. The only problem I had with, with it was just the autofocus and video, and that's because I'm a vlogger. So, uh, and most of that seems to be corrected now with the newer Olympus cameras. <clears throat> but for general photography. You know, if that lens goes on sale for $99, you know, all the time, even at $149, you know, I paid like $200 something when it first came, when I got it, but uh, at $99 or 149 it's a, it's a terrific bargain uh, for photography. And then, like I said, any minor imperfections in the lens that exist, like purple fringing or vignetting, those things are so easily corrected in post-processing, it shouldn't even be a consideration for this lens when purchasing it. The only thing I would consider is if you're thinking about video, I wouldn't get that lens for Olympus.
Oh, hi, hi Z. Um, wow, fan from China. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, Kenya, I, I was thinking about just swapping the board, but like I said, it's about $90 to buy another drive with the same board uh, on my hard drive. And I, I don't know if I want to spend 90 bucks for those three weeks of photos that I lost, because I like I said, I had a backup of everything except the last three weeks. And I'm an idiot because <clears throat> I was editing some... Uh, I was editing a video from a vlog or something, and it started really slowing down and i noticed that the backup software was running at the same time as i was editing so i turned the backup software off so i could finish editing that that video and then you know the computer was running so well i just said well i'll just back up you know on demand i don't want to do it automatically because it's really dragging my system and uh and that's why i lost three weeks because i turned the backup software off now I'm using the Microsoft version of Backup, which does it daily automatically. It actually has a schedule, whereas the other software I was using didn't have a schedule. It was kind of a real-time backup. Um, hey, Brent. Uh, no, you didn't miss much. Just, just me whining about... Uh, losing two terabytes of data and it ended up I only lost three weeks of photos but I killed a two terabyte now the sad thing is I can't remember what else was on that drive other than my 2019 photos I know I had all of my uh, videos that I did in 2019 you know that I, I've already uploaded them to YouTube so that's okay if I lose them I lose them but Anyhow, uh, that's that's all you missed, and I'm still whining about it. Ugh. Um. Kostov is saying that the Panasonic 25 F14 is better than the 25 F18, which is better than the 25 F17. Yeah, it's. I, I mean, I think it's a pretty big leap from an F1.4 to F1.8. Because that 25 f1.4 is a Leica lens, and I've only heard amazing things about that lens. I don't own it because it's like $500, but uh, if it was a focal length I used a lot, I would consider getting that. And Brown is also saying DxO3 is uh, has terrific noise reduction. Yeah, I, I've only heard good things about DxO, so if, if anyone gets it, you won't be disappointed. And I think that's true for most software. Um, these days are all so good, just like our cameras, I, I hate to say it. I mean, some software I... Anyway. Uh, Hi, Rob. I have Olympus OMD M5 Mark II, and I would like to see if I can change my aperture from f2.8 to, to 8. That I see my LCD go darker. Where can I set that in the menu, please? Okay, the the there there's a limit to um, how much darker your live view is going to display. Um, you only have a three stop range. If you're in very good light, bright light, uh, f two point eight. That's about three stops, right? F four, five, six. So yeah, from 2.8 to f8 is three stops, so you should be able to see three stops difference, assuming you have three stops of light um, wiggle room. And, you know, this is a video I should do, is about why the live view doesn't show the actual end exposure. Uh, but on the EM5 Mark II, I need to get my other camera. It's very similar to the Pen F. I'll tell you where you can go and just check your setting. I just can't remember off the top of my head because so many cameras. Hold on. Okay, menu D, display. Let me see if it's here. Yeah, okay, in menu D, the display menu, uh, go into that and scroll down to uh, Live View Boost. And then in Live View Boost, uh, just turn everything off. Uh, that's that's the first thing. So <clears throat> this menu here, Live View Boost menu, make sure everything is off. 
And then um, there's one other setting. It has to do with simulated optical viewfinder, which is only for the EVF, but um, where is that one? That's in the EVF menu, which is... Okay, so in, in the EVF menu here, okay, go in here and then scroll down and then you see the very bottom here, it says S-OVF, make sure that's also off. Uh, so turn that off, turn off the live view boost and that will tell the camera that you wanna see the actual exposure, final exposure in your live view or EVF versus some something else, right? Something that allows you to see for composition better. And if those two things don't work, right? Let's say you, you can see a little bit, like you dial in from f2.8 to f, uh, uh, f4, it looks good, it's, it's one stop darker, but then you go from f4 to f5.6 and it doesn't look any darker on the live view, you've kind of reached the limit of what the live view can actually show you in terms of the correct, uh, the final exposure. And it's something Olympus uh, does more so than other cameras. I'll have to compare against Fuji and Panasonic and see what they do. Uh, but I know on my Sony camera, when I dial in a negative whatever, I can get the screen to go almost black. But what it's doing, is it's not, it's, ac it's not actually showing you what the sensor is seeing. It's just simulating that on the, on the live view. Uh, but it doesn't work as, but you'll, you'll see the effect of this even more so when you try to go plus three stops or plus four stops brightness. If you watch my video on exposure compensation for beginners, uh, I think that will uh, give you an idea of what you can and cannot see in live view in terms of what the final exposure is going to be. And the problem is more prominent in low light situations like indoors or when it's near sunset, uh, any kind of indoor situation your live view rarely represents the true final exposure. All right, uh, let's see. So hopefully, um, Moonport, I hope that that answered your question. If, if you know, check those settings. Oh, thanks, Arthur. I'll check that out. HDD recovery services to solve the dead drive. Yeah, I mean, it's it's either the circuit board or there's something physically wrong with the mechanics if it's a mechanical drive. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a mess. Um, thank you, Terry. Happy New Year. Thank you. Uh, can I get OMD 4 3rd camera back to live view after a full reset? Uh, I'm not sure what the question is. What do you mean back to live view after a full reset? Um, and I, I only, I'm only familiar with micro four thirds, not the original four thirds cameras. So I may not be able to answer that question anyway, if you're talking about the older four thirds cameras. Uh, but if you could clarify a little bit what your question is, I'll try and answer it. Cause that, that by itself, it doesn't, I, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. Um, but thank you, Terry. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, if you know, um, I I try to participate. Terry's Terry would left a private message about uh, that, you know, with some things. But ultimately, he said he likes to share my videos with other channels, and uh, <clears throat> I appreciate that. And. Not, not share with other channels, but in other places like Facebook or Twitter or, uh, you know, the, the, the various forums. Um, you know, I try to participate in some of the forums uh, time to time, but I'm a little bit shy when it comes to actually promoting my own video unless it specifically answers uh, a specific question that somebody had in that video, in that post. Uh, but otherwise, it, it seems a little bit 
you know, I try not to, you know, it's just, it's just not cool to do self-promotion in forums and things. The reason you go to forums is to help people and or ask questions, right, or look for help, not so much to, you know, for self-promotion. So I try not to do any of that except when a video of mine specifically answers a question. Then I'm happy to share it because I feel like I am helping in that case. Uh, versus just shameless self-promotion, right? So uh, I, I rely on a lot of you guys, you know, to promote my channel. Uh, if you think it's, you know, if a particular video you found helpful, if you could share that, because you have, you have, a, you know, you have a lot more eyes and and ears out there that I cannot possibly reach. And you know, the more people that I can help or that you can help, you know, through my channel, uh, the better for you know, the photography community. <clears throat> um, Happy New Year, Roman. Good to see you. Larry, Larry Golfer. Uh, Nature Visions Expo. Why does monitor live view go dark when I flip it up open and hold the camera above my head? It should not. It should not go dark. I I do that all the time. Uh, the only thing I can think of is uh, you know, like on this camera, it, it flips all the way around, right? So basically, I think what what Larry's asking is when he when he holds his camera up high with the monitor tilted down. His live view goes blank, right? And I think that could be sometimes when the sun hits the uh, when the because there's an eye sensor in EVF, right? Sometimes when the sun or a shadow hits the the EVF, like that could cause it to go blank. Because you can see if I just put a little bit of a shadow over over the live view, I have to get a little closer. Sometimes, sometimes it'll, it'll go out. So that's probably what's happening. Um, is there's either a shadow or extremely bright light uh, causing the DVF switch. So the way to do it, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're constantly going overhead like that, is to turn off the EVF auto switching and manually switch it to live view. Uh, Gary Smith is uh, saying, I'm planning on taking my OMD EM1 Mark II on the beach for vacation. I'm a bit worried about sand. Any advice? <laughs> yeah, once you put the lens on the camera, don't take it off when you go out there. Um, other than the other obvious things, don't put your camera in the sand. But try not to change lenses because... Uh, so so try to go out with one lens if you can. That's the only advice I can give you. Don't open up the battery door. Don't open up the memory card because you get sand in anything, anywhere. That's, yeah, that's trouble. <laughs> so bring bring a zoom lens and you can use any kit, kit lens will be fine. Uh, I wouldn't bring a pro lens to the beach. You know, I wouldn't want to ruin that. <laughs> Because uh, you can get sand in a pro lens just as easily as as a kit lens, so bring bring a kit lens and don't don't take the lens off or open anything. Uh, Rob, I missed the first thirty minutes. Did you discuss the four way live stream that you are planning? No, I have not discussed that yet. I will I will come back to that shortly. Uh, who is Sephron has asked me if I fixed my EM5. No, I did not. The uh, I'm just I'm just learning to live with this button. Uh, being for those of you that that weren't around, I I don't know if you can see that. Let me put it this way. I broke this button here. Oh, almost. There it is. See, I broke this button. Uh. Because I dropped the camera and it hit right on that button. No, I haven't fixed it. I'll, I'll, you know, l l it's not a button I use much anyway. It, it kind of sucks to be missing a button, but 
Uh, I'm getting I'm getting along fine without it. I don't want to send my camera away. Maybe maybe in a couple months I'll do it when I I don't want to use it all the time. Right now I just want to use this camera all the time, so I don't want it to be out of my out of my possession for any length of time. Oh no, I haven't heard anything new about the M1 Mark III. Um, but yeah, maybe in the uh, next live stream. Oh, hey Terry. Yeah, yeah. Whenever, whenever you're ha the camera's not Terry's saying he did a full reset and now his live view is back, but. You know, whenever your camera is not acting the way you expect it to, just do a full reset because there's there's so many menu settings buried down into the camera that uh, one could be affecting something that you're trying to do and you can't find what's doing it. So I, I do full factory resets, you know, pretty regular. <laughs> and I've gotten to where I can reset things up back to uh, the way I want it pretty quickly but the other thing I do is I use the custom presets or my sets uh, and save to that you know so I you know I have a my like if you saw my video I just did my most uh, all my settings explained on the M5 Mark III um, I save that to C and I rarely not I wouldn't say rarely but I don't have to do full resets as often now that I just use those those features on that camera yeah sand if she got sand Roman saying a friend of hers took her 20 millimeter out in the desert and she got sand in her lens yeah that sand gets everywhere so I like I said I would not take I would not take a a pro lens out even though they say there's weather seal dust seal <laughs> I wouldn't risk it personally those lenses are too expensive you know one thing that I did is uh, is you know black electrical tape and I, I keep a roll handy all the time but what I did when it was kind of, I knew it was going to be raining and I was using a kit lens, is I wrapped, I wrapped the electrical tape all the way around. Uh, not on a zoom lens, I'm sorry, but on my prime lenses. Um, I wrapped electrical tape all the way around because I wasn't going to manually focus anyway. And uh, that gave me some peace of mind. I don't know how effective it is in real life, but it gave me some peace of mind that <laughs> the lens is, uh, gosh, I might still have... Look. No, I took it off. But on my 45, <laughs> almost knocked over my whole setup here. I, I I just took electrical tape and wrapped it all the way around this lens. Uh like I said, I don't know if that really did anything or not, but it gave me some some peace of mind. So you can try that. And I, electrical tape is really handy for a lot of things in photography. Oh, thank you, Serge. Serge is saying he shared uh, some of my stuff. I appreciate that. Uh, Andy's asking Rob as a rule when you do photo walks do you take one or more lenses and do you use prime or zooms which do you prefer um, I prefer primes personally and I usually take at least two lenses um, which one will be the kit lens 14 to 42 is a very common lens that I take because it's just it's just small and lightweight and if it's daytime this is what I'll primarily shoot with but as the as it gets darker like well after sunset uh, I, I prefer to use a prime with a with a faster aperture uh, so I'll usually take the 14 to 42 or now I'm using this 12 to 32 from Panasonic plus the 17 millimeter prime uh, f1.8 those are my two 
choices for just general photography. Um, because I, I can get by with most things because I, I don't mind high ISO, so I don't mind using the kit lens even when it starts to get a little dark. <clears throat> but uh, sometimes, you know, I, I need the shutter speed, so I have to use a faster aperture. Uh, not because I, I need to get lower ISO, but because I need the faster shutter speed, then I'll switch to a prime. Because uh, I do a lot of photography at night. Um... Okay, I changed those settings and working fine now. Okay. Oh, okay, good, Moon. I'm glad that helped. I can't even remember what your question was now, but I, I do remember you did ask something earlier. I'm glad that helped. Uh, thank you, Steve. I, I try. Oh, who is Severin saying I should send it in and share my repair experience with Olympus? All right, uh, I will share one experience I did have. My Pen F uh about a month after i got it started to power on and off on its own right or power off on its own and you know through various powering on and off taking the battery out etc it would come on sometimes but it was yeah there was definitely something wrong with it so i think like i sent the camera in you know i went online filled out their form they told me where i need to send it and I'm very lucky because there's a repair center in Pennsylvania, which is one day UPS shipping, ground shipping one day. So I sent it to them at my expense, right? I had to pay to send it there. Uh, but they sent it back to me, no cost. Or wait a minute, I don't remember. They may have paid for it to go there too. They may have gave me a shipping label. I can't remember that part, honestly. But shipping was very cheap because it's only one day away whether I paid for it or they paid for it, it would only been about like $12 with insurance. And uh, they sent it back to me. I got it back like within five days. So it went out. They got, so if I sent it Monday, they got it Tuesday. They fixed it Wednesday. They sent it back to me Thursday. I got it on Friday. <laughs> I mean, it was like five to seven days max, the turnaround time, and they fixed it. And I've heard very similar stories with Olympus Repair, that they're excellent. I mean, some people, they get brand new cameras. Like some guy sent his EM5 Mark I in. They couldn't fix it, so they sent him an EM5 Mark II for free. I mean, I've heard stories like that time to time. Uh, so Olympus Repair is has been excellent, at least here in the United States. Um, okay. Tony, no, I'm sorry. Oh, in shutter priority, it's not showing the final exposure. Uh, so Wilman, oh, God, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your name. Uh, but Marty is saying, I uh, explained about final exposure in AV, but in TV, it is not showing the final exposure. Uh, it shouldn't matter which mode you're in. the The rules of that, or the 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 uh, the behavior of the live view, is similar in all modes, whether it's manual, uh, AV, TV, or aperture priority, shutter priority, program mode. Uh, the live view behavior is based on the menu settings that I talked about, the, the live view boost and the SOV in the uh, simulate optical viewfinder. So make sure that everything in live view is turned off. All of the live view boost settings are turned off and the behavior should be the same regardless of what mode you're in. Uh, Hey Rob, if you had a chance to use the GX85 much? No, not 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 since the last time I was I uh, did a vlog with it. Um, yeah, especially this past week with my hard drive crashing and all. <laughs> uh, I do want to take it out. Uh, 
to play a little bit more with the L monochrome and dynamic monochrome. And then also the 4K photo mode. And then compare that to say something like Pro Capture on Olympus. And, and just see what makes, what's a little easier to use or makes more sense in terms of that sort of photography where you're, you know, capturing things before you actually want to take the picture. Uh, because the GX85, I was looking at uh, best sellers on Amazon, at least here for the U.S., and the GX85 is still outselling like the OMD EM10 Mark II based on just looking at best sellers. So, and, and I think that's, it's mainly about price point and features, right? Because when, and, and most of the cameras on the best sellers list are all like $500 cameras, give or take, uh, with, a, with the occasional full frame $2,000 camera thrown in. But it seems like what makes a camera a bestseller is basically price, right? And these are people that are just getting into buying a legitimate camera. Uh, so I, I think I should do more with the GX85 just based on the, the sales that I'm seeing for it on Amazon. There seems like there's a good user base for it that might, might benefit from any insight that I might be able to give, right? Uh, but I need to use the camera a little more and develop a workflow uh, that you know that makes sense to me that I can share. Uh, right now, I'm I'm s just like anybody else with a new camera. I'm still fumbling with the menu um, and still not getting the best images I can out of it uh, because a lot of times when you when you buy a camera. If you just put it on auto mode or program mode and take pictures, you're not getting the best out of that camera. And that's, and I say this every week, but that's the problem with all these drive-by photography reviews or camera reviews is they don't have the camera long enough to really get the best out of it to the point to where somebody might decide that, yeah, this is the better camera for me because it works better for me and my workflow and it gives me the kind of results that I want to get to. Uh, and, and that's why I think Fujifilm film simulations are so popular and a big draw for their cameras because they've, they've, they've really branded those particular art filters very well and marketed it as you can get film simulations out of this camera by pushing a button and you get a great image and and that's 100% true but i you know the same thing is true for the olympus cameras it has many simulations in it or color adjustments but they just call them art filters instead of film simulations but you know the vintage profiles the the uh uh, pinhole profiles, the bleach bypass, the you know there's there's a lot of uh, color profiles that they call art filters, and they didn't market those the same way Fuji would. If if Olympus marketed their art filters as film simulations, like saying, man, this thing this thing imitates Ilford 400, you know, but there's probably a lot of trademark branding issues that they they decided not to go that route at all and just call them art filters. But in the end, they need to really, uh, I think they would do better if they could market those as this is very similar to what, uh, you know, Kodak Color used to be, which is on the Pen F would be mono, a color profile number two is very similar to the older Kodak Color film stock. All right, uh, that was a long answer to a question, do I take the GX85 much? <laughs> uh, hey Rob, just bought a Sony a7 III full frame. I s will still be on your live show. Your show is, thank you very much. If you ever get down to Orlando, let me know. Okay, Terry, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. I do plan on going to uh, Naples, uh, hopefully this year. I haven't been to Florida since 2005. Um, my God, I can't believe it's been 15 years since I've been to Florida. I used to go there all the time. Uh, and 
when I was backing up my hard drive or organizing my backups and things, I found all of my Florida pictures from 2005. They were, and, and I was using my Fujifilm XF10, uh, my old Fujifilm camera <laughs> back then, which is a, you know, a little compact camera. Happy New Year, Brand. Uh, hi, Wooden. I'm glad you could join us. Always good to see you. Um, Maker Bob, thank you for all your hard work. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for watching. I'm, I'm glad it helped. <clears throat> Happy New Year, Gary. Roman's asking, Rob, is it a scientific explanation that in low light, when the picture mode is set to monochrome, it focuses quicker, or it only appears to me that it's quicker than in normal color mode? Oh, uh, you know, I can't imagine it'd make any difference at all. Uh, because the, the camera converts to color after it's taken the pic, I'm sorry, the camera converts the color image, the raw image to black and white after it's taken the picture. <clears throat> uh, the only the only scientific explanation, and this is not anything I could measure with any precision, for any reason, black and white photos to be uh, faster in low light autofocus would be that the camera does not have to generate a color image into the EVF or the live view, so it's using less processing power to process the color image as it would a black and white image, thereby leaving more processing power to the autofocus system. Uh, that is not something I could even measure, uh, so I think it's it's I think it's more a, a perceived difference in focusing than it is an actual real difference. Uh, but if there is a difference, the only explanation I can think of is just in terms of the processing power of the camera to generate a color image for you to look at in live view or the EVF is reduced. Uh, because now it only has to produce a black and white image for you to look at, which is probably, you know, some savings there. I'd be curious to know if if you save any battery life by displaying a black and white image in the EVF uh, or or live view versus color images, uh, I doubt it. But again, that that would be something so subtle that it would it just wouldn't make any real world difference. Uh, hi, John. Softly, good to see you again. Um, I think you emailed me about my little. Uh, uh, battery tester here that I'm using and uh, yeah that was the correct one and I, I am doing some more tests on this which which reminds me uh, from my last video when I was talking about these generic or my last live stream I was talking about these generic batteries um, I think it was Rick Bear was saying that he used these Nuoma batteries and he was getting very good results with this and uh, I happen to have new OMA as well, and I measured this, and this is not an old battery. I got this a few months ago, and it's been, it's maybe got five or six recharge cycles in it, so it's not old. Uh, I was only getting a little over 700 milliamps out of this uh, battery, and it says it's rated for 1220, so they're not exaggerating 2000 milliamps like you see a lot of generics, but ultimately this did not have any more juice in it than any other generic battery I've ever used. Uh, okay. Um, so Rick, if you're watching this video later, if you're not here now, um, I'm not getting any more juice out of this than any other generic. Now, if the long-term performance of it, like the, the drop-off and the power delivery is more consistent for that 700 millima milliamps, uh, that would be a good thing and make this a better battery, but in practice, I cannot, again, it's not something I can actually measure or perceive any difference between this battery and other batteries, other generics. Um,
Oh, okay. So uh, Marty's saying, ha oh, I'm sorry, Happy New Year, Logan. Let me back up a little bit. Digital noise. I got a GX85 for two years. It was great, but I got bored. So I got the Sony A7 R2, but I feel like I can't get comfortable with it. Now I got the PL9 kit for 300 euros and looking into selling the Sony. Yeah. Yeah, I I handled the A7R3 briefly at the camera store when I was buying my uh, Fujifilm, I think. And... I, it you know when you buy that when you buy a full frame camera you have to get the full frame lenses with it and the camera you know the camera itself was already kind of bulky it's bulkier than the M1 Mark II not leaps and bounds bulkier but it was bulkier and then you add the lenses onto it and I, I'm not going back there so I can appreciate uh, you know going from full frame back to micro four thirds. Uh, if not for the handling and the bulkiness, but um, Sony's menu system is not not very manageable. And this is this is the other thing about <clears throat> menu systems in general, because people complain about menu systems in in Olympus and in Sony. I don't hear it so much from the other manufacturers, Nikon, Canon, Fuji, and Panasonic. And I've used all of them, uh, Olympus, Panasonic, Fuji, Nikon, Pentax. But of all the menu systems that I've seen, Panasonic has the best one for me. That, that, that menu system was very intuitive. My mind, I was able to wrap my mind around everything I wanted to do in that camera very quickly. Uh, save, you know, some very specialized features. Uh, Fuji, I struggled with, and I still struggle with a little bit. Uh, I'm, I, and and it's, you get used to anything, right? Once I get used to using it, you know, I'll get through it. And Olympus, I can see where a lot of people are going to struggle with it. You know, my last video on the M5 Mark III settings, at least the settings now are grouped alphabetically to some a little better organized than their previous models. Uh, so I, I put up an acronym like A is for the autofocus system, B is for the buttons, you know, et cetera. Um, so that helps a little bit, but ultimately the menu systems shouldn't matter. There's really only three settings, right? Shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. I mean, if you can find how to set those three things, you should be able to do like 99% of your photography. Uh, you know, everything else on these digital cameras are just uh, kind of accessories and computational, right? Um, so I, I never let a review of a camera, somebody says, oh, the menu system sucks on that camera. You know, I, I don't let that bother me or may sway my decision in any way because ultimately the only thing i have to know is shutter speed iso and aperture right once i know how to do those three things i can learn the rest of the menu system and do those other things whenever so uh anyhow yeah so let's see but the pl9 if for nothing else between the pl9 and a7 III, that's a big big leap right from one system to another in terms of uh you know capability and low light performance and size right there's a lot of huge differences but ultimately you know the micro four third system is going to be cheaper and give you like great results all right so marty's i'm sorry now i can go back to marty's he says when he puts the shutter in one one thousandth of a second it gives you a good view but the end picture is dark and yes that is that is definitely a symptom of the live view is not showing you the the final exposure uh, because it cannot it just cannot do it because the live view is operating off the sensor and the sensor is operating off a certain refresh rate i think it's like one thirtieth of a second like it'll refresh uh one thirtieth or one sixtieth of a second and that's the actual shutter speed that the sensor is operating at if you want to look at it that way 
And then the camera software, the, the CPU has to extrapolate what the final exposure will be. And like I said, you only have three stops of range, plus or minus. So if you're at 1 30th of a second on the sensor, but you set your shutter speed, your final exposure to be 1 1,000th of a second, that's multiple stops away, right? It's 60, 120, 40. You know, we're probably about seven or eight stops difference. So, yeah, the, the live view is not going to show the final exposure when you're more than three stops away in good light. If you're in low light, you're already lost a couple of stops. So the live view is not going to show you the final exposure correctly. Um, so, again, if you watch that exposure compensation video for beginners that I have, it'll it'll kind of get you down the, the path of where I'm going with that that explanation, but it'll demonstrate to you at least that plus or minus three stop limitation of live view. Not not to the, the extent that we're talking about here, but at least it'll put your mindset or or it'll, it'll show you what how I was uh, thinking about live view and exposure compensation. I know they okay. Wooden arrows. I know they say a black screen cell phone background saves battery versus other colors because they don't need to be lit. Uh, that's true for the OLED displays uh, that use like the Samsungs. You know, use an OLED, and every pixel is charged uh, individually. Other other phones that don't use OLED displays, organic LEDs. Uh, use uh, regular LEDs that illuminate from the sides, right? A lot like our computer monitors. There's a there's a tube or row of LEDs on each side or all the way around that light up and illuminate an LCD. O OLED displays illuminate each individual picture, pixel, so that uh, if the pixel is off, it's not draining any power. So... Um, you know, on my phone, I use a black background. I don't use any color like screensavers or anything like that. Just just in the spirit of trying to save battery life uh, because there's a lot of dead pixels. The screen is probably only about 50% lit up and the other 50% is all black. But if I had a display on the back, uh, it won't make any difference. It'll draw more power. But the cameras, the live view on our cameras are LCDs with LED illumination around the side. So generating black images will not theoretically save any more power than having the screen lit, uh, with a full image on it. Uh, because, and, and the way you can tell is when you, um, if you go into a completely pitch black room and turn your camera on, and take a picture, right, and preview the picture, you're going to have a black picture, but you can still see the live view is kind of illuminating a little bit of brightness out of it. So that's how you know that this screen is illuminated by regular LEDs versus if I take my phone, this black part here that's, uh, you know, doesn't have anything on it. If I go down to pitch black room, I will not see any illumination at all from this phone. It's going to be pitch black because that pixel's turned off. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, laptop is saying. Consider that the alphabetic is dependent on the language you are speaking. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> I'm switching from Nikon. Logan's saying, I'm switching from Nikon to Micro Four Thirds. I'm 58 years old and I can bear no more carrying 40 pounds of bag. Yeah, hallelujah. Uh, that's why I switched really is because I, I got tired of carrying uh, so much gear. You know, I... I, you know, when I had my Nikon, I bought the Sigma 24 to 105 f4, you know, art lens because I got tired of carrying all the primes. But that art lens is almost a thousand grand, like a kilo. 
by itself on top of the camera is almost another kilo and it's like you're you're two kilos right whatever pounds that is like i don't even know how to think in 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 uh pounds anymore because all the cameras are <laughs> you know stated in kilos and millimeters right uh or grams and grams and millimeters but uh yeah i got i got tired of carrying around all that gear Yeah, Marty, you know, the, what John is saying about the ISO, what, what he's doing is if you increase the ISO, you know, uh, and this, this goes back to the question when Marty was saying is he's at one one thousandth of a second. And my answer was, you know, that's just too many stops darker than the EVS capable of showing you or the live view. And John is saying uh, basically increase the ISO, right? So what are you doing? You're by increasing the ISO, you're you're bringing the range of the exposure back up closer to um, what the camera will, camera is capable of showing you. So it's you know six and one half of the other. Whatever gets you to that three stops within three stops of one thirtieth of a second uh, will get you to show what. The final exposure is in live view. Oh, okay, sorry. Laptas Perosi says, I meant putting a menu in alphabetical order is not viable because changing the language would make it a mess out of it. Yes, okay, now I understand. Uh, I understand now. Olympus has Japanese menus which get translated into other languages, yes. But I would I would argue that at least in the M5 Mark III, they did put some thought to alphabetical order and grouping them uh, a little bit more logically. Brent is telling me it's 2.2 .2 pounds per kilo. Yeah, that, that sounds right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Rob. Do you know if the Pen F and camera settings are embedded in the raw file for view on workspace? Yes, they are. So if I take a, a, a black, let's say I'm in monochrome profile number two, a black and white image, and I look at the raw file in workspace, it'll show me the uh, black and white image. It's not going to show me the, the true raw file. So what you have to do is, if you want to see the actual raw files, you have to reset everything. And if you go to my website, um, I have a batch file that will reset the raw file back to the camera default so that you will see the true raw image to some extent versus the embedded JPEG or camera settings. And it's not, <clears throat> you're initially seeing the embedded JPEG from the raw file in workspace. But I believe workspace then interpolates, that was the word I was looking for earlier, interpolates what the final image is from the settings that it drew from the EXIF data in the file. So that you're seeing better than the embedded work, the, you're seeing a better image than the embedded JPEG file uh, when, you, when you work with a raw file, but you're still seeing all of the settings embedded in the EXIF data applied to the raw file. So what you have to do is tell Workspace to reset the settings in the EXIF data back to default. And I have a batch file on my, on my website under the Workspace tab that will reset it back to color. Um, so I hope that answers your question. The Pen F camera setting, and, and that's true not just on the Pen F, but any Olympus camera. When you're in workspace, it's going to show you the raw file with the settings that were set in the EXIF data saved in the, from the camera. So if you take a black and white image, even if you work with the raw file in workspace, it's going to show you the black and white image first. 
Uh, Logan says, in plus, I'm a sports photographer, and the image at 6400 ISO and are good quality for newspaper quality. Yes, uh, that's good to know. I mean, I would assume that you're in very good light, and in very good light, the, the image quality is fine, and, and newspaper quality, my God, you know, I think an image from any camera is going to look grainy on a newspaper just because of the print process on newspapers, right? They're, what are they, like 100 DPI or something? Okay, so Maker Bob is saying Lux light showing is happening in the Lux light show. Light projected on the buildings and other... Oh, I've heard about that. That's cool. It's already dark. How would you set up the EM Mark II for these conditions? I'm thinking about no tripod, but this would be different settings with and without the tripod. Yes, the settings would be very different. Uh, I'm not familiar with that light show, but if the lights are constantly moving, you're going to need a faster shutter speed. Hence, you're going to need faster lens and faster uh, higher ISOs uh, if you want to do handheld. Um, I would imagine at least one sixtieth of a second shutter speed for, you know, a relatively moving light show. If it's a very fast moving light show, you're going to need a faster shutter speed. But I think my settings would be one sixtieth of a second at the widest aperture and highest ISO or lowest ISO that that will support that one sixtieth of a second shutter speed. Um, so if you're at one sixtieth of a second f three point five then have it on auto ISO. You know, I don't know. Exposure is kind of a tricky thing, right? So I would I would be in shutter priority and let the camera pick the aperture and ISO uh, for you. So go into shutter priority, set it to 1 60th of a second, and then uh, I would also dial in exposure compensation of a negative, say, two-thirds of a stop. Uh, because you don't want the highlights to be, the highlights, meaning the light show itself, to be blown out with no color. Uh, so you can go ahead and crush the shadows a little bit, like the buildings and the background need to be very dark. Uh, so my guess would be I would try one, one sixth of a second sh shutter priority, and then let the camera pick the aperture and ISO, so be an auto ISO and then dial in a negative two-thirds of a stop on exposure comp and try that. That would be my recommendation to start. And then if the light show is still blurry, meaning the lights are moving too fast, then try faster shutter speed. Increase it to 1 1 20th of a second. Um, or if if the lights are not moving, if it's a static image, you know, you can slow your shutter speed down to, I'd say, maybe 1 20th of a second, whatever you can handhold, you know, you would know this better than me. I'm good at about 1 20th of a second. I can handhold the camera without motion blur. Uh, but that's, that's where I would go. Um, oh, hey, Robin, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Uh, let's see. Robin, Robin's a regular on my live streams. I really appreciate that. You know he's he's been uh, he's been very good about helping uh, a lot of you as well when I'm when I start to jibber jabber on too long about one question. Um, but uh, Maker Bob, hopefully that that helped. Uh, let me know if that how that works out for you. Um, Oh, thank you, Marty. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to get the he/she wrong part. My my pronouns are off sometimes. Uh, how would you compare the OLED viewfinder in the Pen F to the new one in EM5? Because I'm curious, because I know the MK3 has a smaller WF compared to the early... Yeah, um, it's 10% bigger. And I'm not trying to sound 
trying to give you a simple answer because if you look at the specs, it's about 10% uh, bigger, right? The I can't remember the exact numbers. But when I went when I went to the uh, when I went to go buy or I went to the uh, launch event for the M5 Mark III, I took my uh, EM10 Mark II, which has the same viewfinder as the M the Pen F, and I compared them like this side by side, and it's 10% bigger, but it feels more than that. It seems like perceptually it feels that 10% makes a big difference. Uh, it's it's quite a bit better and I also noticed that I can hold this a little bit further away from my eye as well and still see it pretty clearly I think about right about here is my limit but I can still see the entire image and I think that's something to do with eye relief but yeah it's very good the viewfinder is awesome in the M5 Mark III like I said, it's 10% bigger. Um, Moon is saying, which monochrome settings do you like more? Panny GX80, Olympus OMD, and what is the difference? Right now, I I really like the... the uh, Olympus monochromes, but I only say that because I, I'm familiar with tweaking the settings, the highlights and shadows, because uh, I know how to get the image that I want out of the Olympus. Straight out of camera, I still prefer uh, the Olympus images, again, because it has a lot of default settings. Um, well, let me rephrase that. I was I was talking about the Pen F, but generally the Olympus, the the straight Olympus monochrome setting, uh, without anything from the Pen F. I honestly I can't tell much difference between the static standard black and white images from any other camera. The differences are so subtle; it's not worth mentioning. The only differences come into play is when you start to use some of the uh, custom black and white settings that each of these cameras have. So I really like the dynamic monochrome in the in the Panasonics. The L monochrome, not a big fan. It's a little bit too flat. I like very punchy uh, colors. And, and I can say the same for Olympus standard monochrome. I'm not a big fan of it just straight out of camera black and white conversion. I like to mess with the highlights and shadows, and sometimes I apply grain, which can be done on the Fujis and the Panasonics, but I don't see that feature in every Olympus. I only see it on the Pen F. Uh, but I don't apply grain very often, but when I do, you know, I like it. Uh, if, if I don't have, if you don't have a grain option on your Olympus camera, just crank the ISO up. That'll give you grain, you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, so that's, I, I don't have a preference. I think I can get a good black and white image out of any camera uh, because they all ha seem to have good settings in terms of highlights and shadows and time-to-time uh, -time grain settings. And they also have very good built-in profiles like the L monochrome, the D dynamic monochrome in Panasonic, and then the Acro settings in the uh, Fuji is very good. Uh, I also, you know... But I, I'd say out of all the cameras, though, the Pen F still has the best monochrome settings available to it uh, because you have the, uh, on the Pen F, oh, I powered it down. The Pen F has this, like right now I'm in monochrome, right? Um, the Pen F has, this is very unique. Uh, it has a color filter dial, which I can rotate around, so I don't have just your standard uh, red red filter, yellow filter, orange filter, green filter. I also have yellow, green, there's yellow, That's a, everybody has yellow, everybody has orange, everybody has red, but not many people have magenta, right, as a color filter. And everybody has blue, but not everybody has cyan as a color filter, and everybody has green but not everybody has yellow-green. In addition to that, I can change the intensity. 
I can increase the intensity and I can decrease the intensity. So like, like behind me is a green screen, right? So if I increase the intensity of the orange filter, that green is going to get darker. But my skin should get lighter. Not the best example, but this is very, very unique to the Pen F. In addition to, it does have a grain, a grain structure that is supposed to uh, change along with the uh, tone of the picture itself. So in the shadow areas, the grain pattern is different than the shadow areas in the highlights. Uh, then the grain the grain pad will be different in the highlights. So I like I like the customization I have with the Pen F, and that that color filter array in the Pen F is very unique. I've not found that in any other camera that I've used. Uh, so if you're a black and white photographer, I would strongly recommend looking at the Pen F and all of the in camera features. Um. But yeah, Moon, basically for monochromes, if you're looking at the straight, static, or standard monochrome setting, there's not much difference between any of them. All they do is reduce saturation out of the image. It's only in the specialized uh, monochrome profiles that are available that you'll really find any difference. Oh, John's asking why. Oh, I guess Robin answered it. Uh, I, I think, let me expand on that a little bit. Robin, though, the uh, I noticed that with the exception of the Pen F, uh, it seems like, well, I think Robin's answer is best. It's basically anything older than the Pen F. I mean, long story short, but it has to do with the, the processing engine, the, 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 the TruePix 7 processors. All of those cameras are older, and, and with the exception of the Pen F, do not have uh, color wheels in them, but you can use the color wheel on just about everything else. Now, I do have a hack that you can apply color wheel to any Olympus RAW file, John. All you have to do is convert the RAW file, say from your EM10 Mark II, convert that to a TIFF file, and then you can edit the TIFF file with the color wheel. So. <laughs> That's just a little tip there if you want to do that. You can also edit the JPEG files with the color wheel, but then they don't have as much range as a RAW file would or a TIFF file. So convert convert your RAW files to TIFF, and then Workspace will allow you to work with the color wheel on that TIFF file. Uh... Let me catch up here. Let's see, when when are you doing your common live stream? Oh, Logan. Okay, Logan's at, wait. John is asking, any experience with the cheap $100 gimbals? No. Uh, I have not used any cheap gimbals. I have one that I paid like $600 for about three years ago. Uh, but since getting the M1 Mark II, uh, I, I haven't really needed it. Um, okay, so Logan, okay, so now I'm, up, I'm caught up to Logan here. When are you doing your common live stream with Red? Um, Okay, the, the tentative date, where are we at? We're, God, we're an hour and a half into this live stream already. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. Um, our tentative date is January 16th at 3.45 p.m. for the live stream. And I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna announce it in the uh, my community tab and on my Facebook page. And then Robin and Peter and Maddie Solanto are also going to uh, announce the official date. That's that's the tentative, 99.9% .9 sure that's going to be the date and time. January uh, 16th. Let me double check. Let me double check. Yeah, January 16th at 3.45 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, EDT. Um, we're going to confirm that uh, this week. 
between the three of us or four of us the exact time and date. But I think we've all agreed on that time and date. And Red 35, I, I haven't reached out to him yet because I think the three that I have are a good start. Uh, and if that goes over well and, and I don't mess it up too much, I will try and reach out to other creators uh, to see if they'd be interested in doing a live stream like that. And I'm sure, you know, Robin and Peter and Maddie will also do that. I think Maddie's already done something like that, but uh, we'll do these uh, collaborative live streams. Maybe they'll invite me. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but the, uh, you know, I'm, if like I said, if after this one that I do with the Peter, Robin, and Maddie goes well, meaning I don't mess it up too much, then I will reach out to other creators, um, such as Red35, maybe Jane Popsies, maybe, uh, you know, Micro Four Nerds. Those, you know, those are the ones because they're all Micro Four Thirds users. Uh, but, you know, why not? You know, some other bigger channels. Um, by big, I mean like huge, right? Tony Northrup, Jared Poland. <laughs> you know, why not, right? Uh Let's see. Maybe camera conspiracies. Man, that guy's a lunatic, though. <laughs> I love his channel. Uh, let's see. Tim. Tim swears by ACDC. Yeah, ACDC gets, you know, like I said, ACDC, this is this this software's come up a lot. Uh what what attracted me to ACDC is the uh it makes use of the EXIF data and I, ITPC data in part of its uh, asset data management function. So I think it's a little bit more of a, a, you know, more of a technical program with all of the features it has. But if you're technically minded or that, that workflow works for you, I think ACDC is a terrific software as well. And it's very reasonable, less than a hundred bucks, I think. So Arthur said he took some night photos and he used the night plus portrait mode and he said it worked great. So yeah, if you want if you want a simple way to do it, uh, you can use one of the scene modes in our Olympus cameras uh, to try the exposure for you. But um, so you can you can try both if you got time, right? Sometimes things move too quickly and you have to pick one, right? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Is there a way, Magnus is asking, is there a way to change the exposure when you're in auto ISO? Some kind of exposure, exposure compensation. Yeah, there, there is exposure compensation on all the Olympus cameras uh, for photography. Uh, in video mode, I think the only time auto ISO doesn't work is in when you're in full manual video, but for Photography, yeah, there is exposure compensation for all modes, except manual. <laughs> uh, when you're in manual mode, uh, auto ISO, you cannot do exposure compensation in full manual mode, even with auto ISO on. Uh, you should be able to, but you cannot. So you have to just control either the shutter or aperture to control your exposure comp when you're in manual mode. Uh, Laptasas, ah, uh, Laptasof. Fosse, I can't read your name. I wish we had audio so you could tell me how to pronounce this. But he's saying, uh, I was never able to replicate the depth of sky in black and white from my Pen F in my GX9. The, late, the latter is very nice for street photography, but not for landscape. 
Yeah, the Pen F has a very, very strong red filter, which is adjustable, like all the colors in that color wheel. So that's that's like what I said. The red filters uh, are purely subject or are not subject, but arbitrary from manufacturer to manufacturer. One manufacturer might decide to put a stronger red filter than another manufacturer. But with the Pen F, it's adjustable. And that's that's the big difference with the Pen F uh, black and white photography. I mean, a lot of people just do it in post-processing, so it's kind of a moot point. But if you want to do it in camera, uh, the Pen F is awesome. Olympus EM1 Mark III in 2020, it's been a long time. Yeah, it's due. <laughs> it's due. Omega Loopy saying, you know, what's going on with the M1 Mark III? We'll see. We'll see. I, I would I wouldn't be surprised if it comes out this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if it comes out next year in 2021. Uh because it, it's gonna have to be a pretty substantial leap in tech, like every EM1 mark uh EM1 in the past has been from one model to the next, has been pretty substantial in terms of features. Image quality, yeah, there's been a progression, but I think in feature set, the M1 Mark 1 to the M1 Mark 2, there was a substantial jump in number of features. Uh, so we'll have to see if we get that same substantial jump. For, they want, they'll, they'll need to do that for the M1 Mark 3 is what I'm saying. What's my photography vision for 2020? Uh, oh, I, I don't know. It's so big, right? I... I <laughs> Photography is such a big field. I I don't I don't even know where to start every day when I go out. Every day is like, what am I going to do today? Uh, it's hard enough without thinking, what am I going to do for the rest of the year, to be honest? I can tell you that one thing I do want to do better uh, for 2020 is, you know, I've gotten to where I, I'm comfortable with how I'm composing photos, meaning, you know, whether it's rule of thirds or diagonals or... I'm I'm very comfortable with capturing the image that I want technically, meaning the composition's right, the exposure is right. It's doing everything I want it to do. Like I said, I'm not saying it's a good picture. I'm just saying when I take a picture, it's exactly what I wanted, composition-wise, exposure-wise. What I really want to improve on this year is uh, being able to tell a story in my photos. Uh, and if you watch that video that I did last year on the most important thing in photography, you know, it was essentially was about you need to be able to tell a story in your photography. And uh, <clears throat> that's something that I need to work on a lot harder this year because I saw a photo and what really brought this to light for me was a photo that I saw from someone on Instagram. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember their name is they took a picture of a bicycle kind of parked in this on the sidewalk or not in the sidewalk but underneath some stairs or something and i looked at the photo of this bicycle and i was like this is this is a beautiful picture and then the caption the caption really connected why i thought that was a nice uh picture because i i've there are so many bicycles in alexandria where i live there's so many bicycles around here, and I cannot get a good picture of a bicycle, no matter how hard I try. <laughs> I'm not happy with any of my pictures of a bicycle. But when I saw that picture, and then I, I, I said, why is this so nice? And then I read the caption, and, it's, and then he told me what, his, what the story was of this bicycle was, was that it's like it's waiting to be taken out for the day, to be, to be ridden, you know? It's waiting for somebody. And I said, wow, you know, when I looked at the picture, I'm like, wow, that's exactly what I'm getting from it. I didn't know why at first I liked this picture, but when I read the caption, I was like, that's why this is a great picture because it's, it's showing the bicycle in, in a position waiting to be, to be ridden or taken out. And that's what hit home to me is, and that's, that's what I want to do better in 2020 is really to look at a scene and say, okay, where is the story in this scene? What would make this image, uh, a, a, you know, more interesting than just a snapshot? Because up to now, 
a lot of my pictures are just snapshots. And if they tell a story, it's totally by accident because I've never intentionally went out to tell a story uh, with my photo walks and my photography. So that's that's where I want that's where I want to go. That was a great question, Omega. Though, thank you. Or Shreyas, I'm sorry. That was a great question, Shreyas. Uh, oh, thanks, Robin. It's scanned from popular film. Interesting. That's what I'm saying. And, and, and Robin is saying that the Pen F grain effect was scanned from popular film. And that's what I mean is Olympus did not market their... Uh, their, their art filters as film simulations because they never made film. <laughs> as far as I know, Olympus never manufactured film. Like Fuji makes films, so they didn't have any trademark copyright issues when they said, we're going to make these film simulations. But Olympus does film simulations. They just don't, they're just not allowed to call it anything. They have to be more generic and say, this is our monochrome profile, right? <laughs> um, Let's see, Moon Pond. I understand now meant in build custom ones. Okay. <laughs> Good. I'm glad I answered that. I can't remember now. My my short term memory is 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 short. And my long term memory is is short. So I don't know. Uh for monochrome, maybe it's better work with RAWs and Lightroom or Photoshop. You can get monochrome JPEG if you have one. It's true, but you can still do much more with a raw file because the underlying raw file has the colors in it. And when you start to work with monochrome images in post-production, you can really get dramatic results when you're working with the individual color channels from the raw file. So if you want to, because if you have a black and white image, a black and white JPEG, you're not going to be able to say apply a red filter to that because all of the color information is gone and applying a red filter to a JPEG image is not going to make any difference. Versus when you work with a raw file, all that color information is still there and then you can work with the individual color channels and you can do color mixing or channel mixing. Uh, you know, there's, there's so many techniques and processes that can be done in post-processing for monochrome images, but most of them rely on the fact that you have the original raw file and the original color data of that raw image to work with. Uh, the only thing you can do with a JPEG image really is work with the highlight shadows and contrast. Uh, you're not going to be able to work with the color channels. Um, Patrick is saying, I was a black and white photographer back in the 70s and 80s and bought the Pen F for the in-camera monochrome setting. So much easier than changing filters. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it, though? And, and like I said, the, the adjustable intensity of the individual color filters is awesome on the Pen F. We need more women photographers. So Robin Wong is a vote for Micro Four Nerds to come in. I should have, uh, well, okay. Yeah, we'll reach out to them. Like I said, if I don't mess up the one on, because what happens January 16th and I totally bomb it, like something technical, you know, like we, we keep dropping in and out or something. I'm not going to, you know, start calling everybody and say, hey, look at this live stream I did with Peter, Robin, and Maddie. You know, would you like to would you like to be in one? And they'll be like, hell no, you, you, you did a crap job. So I need to do a good job. With the four, the, the three guests that I'm going to have uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, and then I will start to reach out to more creators um, because there's other creators outside of Micro Four Thirds that I find fascinating or, or really love their channels. Like uh, Nick Carver's channel is awesome. That guy, he just did another on location video where he's taking a picture of a deli or something. And it really inspires me. I mean, he's a he's a large format film photographer, but I, I get so inspired because he really thinks talks about the lighting in the scene, the story in the scene, uh, and and the composition, and all of those things are the most important things when you take a picture, not the gear that you have. And his thought process and his rationale and everything, you know, get me 
just inspire me to no end, that process part, right? That process of taking the image. Um, so I, I love Nick Carver. There's another guy, I think his name is Steve Onias. On, on, Onias? I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name. He shoots uh, Micro Four Thirds and film often together. Uh, he does a, gr a great job, and I'd love to have him as a guest on the, on the channel. Um, and, and a few others that I, I can't remember now. Uh, but, I, you know, when I go back and I start watching YouTube, you know, I always check their channels out. I subscribed and see what's new from them. Uh, I only remember those two because recently they, they, they just put out a couple of videos recently. Uh, okay, so... Uh, let's see... Oh, John, you just updated ACDC. Yeah, it's um, and it's not technical to learn. Okay, that's good. I'm what I, what I meant was is that it has a lot more features that you won't find in other uh, other um, processors, post -pro not processors, but other uh, picture editors. Like I was specifically like working with ITPC information and EXIF data, you can work with a lot easier, I think, in ACDC. Rob, feel free to make a video showing all of the in-camera options you can do in the Pen F. <laughs> okay, Ken. I do have a lot of videos on the Pen F, but I have not done a video specifically about the uh, color wheel, right? Um, and all of the settings that I do with this. Um, you know, that's more like a photo walk type thing, because I, I change those constantly when I'm out on a photo walk. So maybe... Um, when I do a photo walk, I will talk about the settings. I'll have to verbalize a lot of them because I used to be able to attach a camera to the back and record the screen as I'm making the settings. But I think most Pen F owners at this point in time have had the camera a while and will be comfortable with me just verbalizing the, the changes I'm making to the settings. At least I hope so. I'm going to try that and see. And if, if I get a lot of questions as to how did I do that, then I may have to do a tutorial specifically on how I made those settings. 1X is a one-off model for now. It's not meant to replace... Yeah, the, the Mark III is due. No, no question. Uh, Digital Noise is asking me if I've ever ordered or or used the SLR Magic 8mm f4. No, I, I have not. I'm not familiar with that lens at all. Uh, but, you know, when you come back next week or the week after, you know, you can... Uh, you can pop in and, and share with us. You know, I'm thinking about on my website to add a forum section. Because uh, the challenge I'm having is... People email me suggestions for videos, and they go to my email, but then after a while they kind of get lost, and then I forget all of these great ideas and suggestions. But if they're in a forum that I can go to and just look at in a thread, you know, that'll be a lot easier for me, and then I can crank out a lot more videos that are more specific to what you guys are asking me rather than sort of generic videos that I do. Uh, you know, like the, the one video I did, all my settings explained on the M5 Mark III, that, that's a video, it's a deep dive into the menu system, but that's a generic video, right? It doesn't really answer specific questions that people have, uh, which I try to do in a live stream to some extent, but it's not the same as doing a full-on, you know, screen shots and buttons. And uh, so... Check out my website later this week, and I'm going to try and add a forum section to it uh, that, you know, that way I can better help you guys.
Am I still ignoring the M1 Mark III questions? Uh, I would say I'm not ignoring them. I just don't know anything. <laughs> so I honestly, I have no idea. And you know, manufacturers, they, they do not announce or leak things until they do. Uh, as soon as something's leaked, um, I guarantee you there'll be a hundred videos on it on YouTube. <laughs> and, and and 43 Rumors is pretty good at, at sharing leaked information. That would be the first place I'd, you'd probably find any info on the M1 Mark III. Didn't Yogi Berra used to say, my short-term memory is short? I don't know, Yogi Bear. I don't know who that is. The name's familiar, but who is that? <laughs> I think your photos are not snapshots. A snapshot, oops, the, I lost my place here. Oh, thanks, Moon. Yeah, like I said, I, I'm pretty happy with the pictures I'm taking. He said he thinks my snapshots are more than snapshots. They have composition, a lot of thought. Uh, like I said, I do put a lot of thought into, you know, my basic process is I look at the light in the scene. So I try to find interesting light and, and, and where the light is. Then I look at the composition, mainly geometry of the scene and balance. And then I think about what is the subject in that scene. And, uh, you know, I need, I need to do more on the story side or subject side. That is the weakest link because in my thought process, that's number three, right? It really should be number one. What is the subject and then work the scene? I don't know. It just, that's something I have to really, really work on because my images, uh, and I think in Robin Wong's video he did last week, uh, he recommended a book in one of his videos to get, and I, I was thinking about getting that book. Uh, so if you haven't seen that video, I can't remember what it was called. Maybe Robin, you can chime in. <laughs> You did a video and you recommended a book on composition. I think it was your street photos, right? How to take better street photography or street photos. Uh, you had recommended a book in that video that, that I want to get. Um, it was about composition. Yeah, Bresson. Cardio Bresson. Yeah, he's a... Uh, uh, he's amazing. I did look at some of his pictures, Logan. Uh, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Did you just get in? <laughs> I haven't seen you up till now. Uh, in the Micro Four Thirds lower end cameras, I noticed that you cannot set a minimum shutter speed when choosing ISO. That's true. That's true. Only the, the some cameras have that. The pen F and up, really. Um, there is a... Uh, there is a workaround though. If you set the shut, uh, now the, in auto ISO, it's not an option available say on the EM10, but it is available on say the, the Pen F and the EM5 Mark III, et cetera, and the EM5 Mark II. There is a, a minimum shutter speed you can set where let's say you want to take the set the shutter speed to 1 20th of a second uh, as a minimum, like I did in my EM5 Mark III video, but then uh, so that the camera will not raise the ISO until it has to go below that 1 20th of a second, right? The workaround is to set your flash sync speed down to uh, 1 30th or 1 20th of a second. And I found that seems to lower the shutter, allow the shutter speed to go lower is by setting the, and all the cameras have that. And I'm going to experiment with that a little more. Uh, and maybe do a short tutorial on that, but I find that if I set the, the flash sync speed down to 1 20th of a second, for example, the shutter speed will drop down to 1 20th. It has almost the same effect as the higher end uh, features that you find on other cameras. With my Nikon D 3500, I can adjust my aperture as need be while letting the camera choose ISO without shutter speed going too low.
Oh, so you're 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 doing exactly opposite. You want you want a minimum shutter speed to be faster, like one two fiftieth. Um, I haven't tried it that way. My little hack for our EM tens. Um, where is my EM ten? It's on the shelf there. Um, let me try that. I need a battery though. Where are all my batteries? Gosh. All right, Lauren, let me see if this hack works. Maybe it'll help you with your street photography. So you want a faster shutter speed of 1 250th. So let me get into, uh, we'll do aperture priority. What are you saying? Let's see, while letting. Well, let me try it in aperture priority. And in this this room, I have too much light in this room. Let me put my hand over. One fiftieth of a second. All right. Let's say I want to be at one two fiftieth. Let me set my slow limit to. One two fiftieth. No, oh, that doesn't work. It's because I got the flash off. It shouldn't matter because. No, that doesn't work. <laughs> so that trying to go faster, it works when I go lower, when I set the shutter speed slower, but if I set the flash sync speed higher to one two fifty a second, it doesn't it doesn't try to maintain that shutter speed. So yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a big difference uh, between say the the lower EM ten models that don't have the auto ISO with shutter speed minimums. Okay. Well, Robin's answered your question too. Oh, okay. He's just saying that the higher end cameras have it. Uh, yeah, Lauren, I, you and I, I think we talked about it last week. Photo, Photoscape X is awesome. I mean, I don't, I don't do a lot of post-processing, but I did like when I did Photoscape X, a few filters it had, it was pretty nice. Yeah, Kent, the workaround I was thinking of was that uh, there, he's saying that there's a workaround for that minimum shutter speed. It seems to work when you lower the shutter speed or slow it down, but when you speed it up to say 1 250th, the flash sync speed hack doesn't work. Uh, the other day I realized that auto ISO isn't working properly in manual mode. I saved manual mode with auto ISO plus a few minor tweaks as custom two a few months back. The other day I realized, okay, that's the same. I tested this by pointing the camera at the same scene, for example, in custom two, I get ISO of 2000, but in manual mode, it's all the way down to 160. If I put my hand in front of the lens, which goes all the way up to 6400. Uh, man, I'm way behind because these are questions from like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> but let me try and let me try and uh, understand what Magnus is asking. 
Auto ISO isn't working properly. So in custom two, I get ISO 2000, but in manual mode, it goes all the way down. If I put my hand in front of the lens, it goes all the way up to 6400. You know, Magnus, I, I'm still not sure where, at what point in that process you're losing, you're, you're getting that difference in ISO. Uh, the other day I realized auto ISO, because I you saved a manual mode with auto ISO. Okay. You have to check your shutter speed, really, because... Uh, when you say when you save the custom too, I guess it does save the shutter speed too. But make sure you're using the same shutter speed between those two different tests that you were doing. Um, and then I'm not sure which camera you have either, Magnus. So. Um, I gosh, I wish I wish we could be a little more interactive because going back and reading this, it's a little bit hard to follow. But I think um, I, I need to know which camera you have, and then I can kind of get a better idea of what's going on. If it's the EM10 without a minimum shutter speed setting for auto ISO, um, oh my gosh, I'm a little bit lost. But I, I know where you're coming from. Let's see. So if I go into manual mode. Yeah, the ISO jumps. And then you're saying. So, oh, so OK, OK. There, all right, so you saved manual a manual mode setting in custom too. So let me do that. I'm starting to I'm starting to catch on what you're doing. So I'll save it to custom number two. So if I go to custom two, what if I? Yeah, you know, um, Magnus, it, it has to do with your shutter speed, I think. So make sure when you're in custom two that the shutter speed is the same as when you're in manual mode and then see how the camera behaves. Because um, that's, that's, that's the only thing I can kind of gather from that. Um, I'm sorry I spent so much time on that, but I was trying to understand the question, but that's the only thing I can think of right now. Oh, the video. Yeah, thanks, Robin, for clarifying. Michael Freeman, The Photographer's Eye. Uh, that, that was the book that Robin recommended in his video. <laughs> Jan, I'm going to sell my X-T30 to buy an EM1 Mark III. I doubt it. <laughs> I, I have a hard time letting go of gear. Uh, by the time the M1 Mark III comes out, you know, this will be worth like $400, right? Because look look what happened to the food, a lot of the Fuji films, right? Uh, except for the X-Pro series, the, their prices go down fast. Uh, I don't know. I, I, that, the X-T30, it's... Uh, anyway, it, it is what it is. Um... Yeah, the my menus, Lepto, the the my menus need to come back. I mean, in a hard way. I mean, that's uh, if there's one thing I miss on my EM5 Mark III, my God, it's it's the custom settings, uh, being able to recall them either through the mode dial. I think they're gonna have to do it on the mode dial because they already have a C on here, so it's gonna be a little bit of a there's going to be some conflict if you're going to sign my sets to a button and the mode dial at the same time. So they'll probably 
they should probably let us set the mode dial like like I never use scene mode or art mode uh, directly indirectly I use them so if we could assign C2 and C3 to art mode and scene mode and I auto have a C4 that would be awesome Um, oh, thanks, uh, Benis. Yeah, the, the minimum shutter speed only works with mechanical shutter speed with flash, because flash is a mechanical shutter speed uh, requirement, or requires mechanical shutter. That may have changed on the M5 Mark III. I thought I saw somewhere you can use silent mode and a flash. I have to look into that. Um... But burnt be nice to you. Yeah, be nice to you is saying uh it has to be a mechanical shutter, which is true. Yogi Bear played baseball. Oh, yeah, I'm not a baseball fan, <laughs> John. But thanks, thanks for bringing that up. My God, I'm so behind here. Uh, hi, Rob. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Rob. Yogi Bear for the Yankees. Okay, I have no idea. I, I don't follow sports hardly at all. Although I have been watching a lot of boxing and MMA lately. I liked. Uh, I was watching some old Mike Tyson uh, fights. That guy was that guy was amazing. It's amazing boxer. Uh, Okay, thanks for clarifying, Robin. Yeah, so the shutter, the speed sinks one twentieth of a second on the uh, flash. So yeah, just read Robin's comment there. You can use silent mode with flash for the Pen F and EM5 Mark II. The flash sync speed is one twentieth. The M1 Mark II and newer cameras, the flash sync speed is one sixtieth in silent mode, which is that's that's pretty cool. I'm not sure why you would use silent mode though with a flash. Uh, maybe for pets and things, I guess. That sound of that clackety shutter sometimes. I've noticed that my one dog that I used to have, man, that shutter used to freak him out. Flash didn't bother him. So I could see with pets that would be kind of cool. Hi Outlook, how are you? Good morning. Oh, you want a short menu. Left us saying the my menu, I mean uh, Panasonic did with an empty menu that you can easily access. Uh, yeah, you just want a shortcut. Uh, yeah, like the EM1X has that, but they didn't do that in their other cameras. Um, a my menu or custom menu that you can make, make for yourself. Because Nikon, they call it custom menu, I think. Uh, yeah, that, that would be handy, though. That's true. You can quickly access the things you use all the time. Sil oh, the 50. Yeah, that's right. You know, Robin, you, you, you reminded me. Silent mode is needed for 50 megapixel high res. You can take a studio shot with flash. With 50. I did do a video on that, actually. I totally forgot about that, of how to use flash with... Uh, uh, well, I didn't do it specifically on high res shot mode. I did it on uh, I did a video on focus stacking or focus bracketing with flash. Uh, and I may have included the high res mode too, but I can't remember. That video is really old. I should really redo a lot of my flash uh, videos. Uh, 
now that it's like cold and raining all the time, I'm going to be indoors a lot. <laughs> I think I'm all caught up on the questions. So that's awesome. And man, it's almost 12 o'clock. Uh, yeah, focus bracketing. Yeah, Robin, that's right. Um, yeah, I do have a video on that, using flash with focus bracketing. But anyhow, um, where was I going? Yeah, so I hopefully I've answered everyone's questions up to this point. Um, if I did not, ask me again. Because every time, now, every time I do these live streams, I actually watch them again uh, myself, sometimes a couple of times, two or three times after I've already done the live stream. So we're talking, you know, four to six hours after this is over, I watch them again. And I always find somebody that I miss their question. And it's not intentional. <laughs> I just legitimately just, I missed your question. Uh, because I, you know, the way this is set up, I have to scroll up and down. And uh, so if you're still here and I didn't answer your question, just don't hesitate to ask me again. I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, okay, so here's a good example. Like, I almost missed uh, Palumbo's here. Um, when using the Godox flash mounted on a hot shoe with slow 2 selected, uh, the camera fires a pre-flash before the slow 2 fires. Um, <clears throat> that pre-flash is basically for uh, when you're in a... You, you have to be... You have to change the flash mode to fill in I believe so where's where's a camera that has a battery here you can do it in your super control panel so let me turn the flash on All right, why is my flash not working? Oh, because I'm in silent mode. All right, hold on. There. So this part, this part here that I've highlighted, uh, right now the flash is an auto. You need to change that to fill in so that you just have the lightning bolt like this. And that should that should get rid of that pre-fire. Because the camera is pre-firing to measure the exposure, but if you tell the camera just fire the flash without just manually, then it won't do that pre-fire. That should that should work. Uh Okay, so hopefully, Palumbo, that answered your question. Give that a shot, though. That should work. And you probably saw my video on how to set up the Godox for off-camera flash. Uh, I do demonstrate that particular problem with that pre-fire, it's not a problem, but that particular uh, workflow where it pre-flashes or doesn't pre-flash. Yes, Ken, I, I will try. I was, um, you know, with the Pen F, I, a lot of the settings I change on the fly when I'm in the field because it's, it's so uh, flexible when you're in the field. And uh, so it, it'll be more of a photo walk type video if I do something like that where I can show all the different options I do on the Pen F. 
Uh, and again, it's because I think most owners at this point are pretty familiar with the pen F uh, with the settings. So I can just verbalize the settings uh, rather than doing it on a full on tutorial where I have, you know, the camera set up with another camera behind it, etc. Um, that might that. Yeah, I'd like to do that. I, I took the pen F out the other day. Oh, like I said, I got two vlogs that I did this week, and they they both bombed. I, I I wanted to post them because I I hate you know. Oh, anyway, um, that's that. But do I ever use vintage lenses? Yes. Now by vintage, now Moonpon is asking, do I ever use vintage lenses? Um, and by vintage, I use like 1970s and 1980s lenses. They, some wouldn't call those vintage lenses, but they're vintage to me, right? Um, but there, there are others that use that go way back to the 50s and 40s and 20s, right? They, they get those Russian, Russian lenses, and then there's the old Jupiter lenses. There's a lot of lenses from the 50s and 60s. That are that are excellent. Uh, I have not bought any of those, but I do enjoy vintage lenses from Nikon from the 70s and 80s that were manual focus. Um, the 135 f3.5, the uh, the 105 f2.5 Nikon's. I love those lenses. I also have the 200 millimeter f4. There's they're kind of scattered all over my room here, but yeah. I do use vintage lenses, and I have a video about adapting lenses to Olympus cameras. We set up the focus peaking, you set up the uh, uh, image stabilization, etc. So you can check that out if you're interested in in doing that. It's it's very easy though. You might be able to figure it out without looking at my video. Who knows? So Palumbo's asking how to get only second curtain flash without a pre flash. Oh, that's a good question. Because you were saying you're in slow two selected. That's a good question. Uh, I have to give that, I have to, let me write that down. That is not something I can answer off the top of my head actually, because I never do it. Um, I used to have a thousand pens sitting here. Okay. So you're in slow two without pre flash. And it's on camera. So you're using the Godox on camera, right? On camera. Uh, yeah, I'll have to give that some thought. That's um, that's not a type of photography or workflow I've ever had to deal with. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Maybe Robin knows. I, I don't know. Uh, Ken, I tried my old Canon FD on Olympus, but was disappointed. It was extremely soft compared to modern lenses. Yeah, they're, they're okay. So the, the challenge, because you hear this time to time of using vintage lenses on uh, digital cameras. Uh, Tony Northrop's one of those guys that uh, is very adamant that using vintage lenses or uh, on our on our digital cameras are not going to be as good, um, and I think to some extent that's a very broad stroke answer to why. I don't think he really explains why. He just says that they are not as good or not as sharp. 
But I think the rationale or the reason for it is the pixel pitch, particularly on our micro four thirds cameras and very high megapixel cameras like A7R4, when you put on older vintage lenses that were designed for film, there's a lot of uh, uh, lens, what's, oh my God, what's the word I'm looking for? Lens defects or imperfections about every lens ever manufactured, whether it's vintage or modern. Modern lenses, you know, they have the electrical contacts and those imperfections or defects in the lens are corrected by the software in the camera. Uh, like if you use an Olympus lens on an Olympus camera, and it kind of goes back to why I was saying you always use Olympus lenses with Olympus cameras, because if you put a Panasonic lens on an Olympus camera, it doesn't have that software to do those sort of corrections like purple fringing, uh, vignetting, etc. And vintage lenses are the same thing, right? The, the Olympus camera does not have, or any camera, digital camera, does not have a database of that vintage lens in it. So all of the imperfections that are normally corrected by the software in the camera, particularly uh, purple fringing and vignetting, are non-existent for vintage lenses. And in addition to that, the pixel pitch of the high resolution cameras and our micro four thirds cameras, even though they're 16 megapixel or 20 megapixel, they are very high resolution cameras relative to their pixel pitch. Um, so it, it's able to see those imperfections in the lenses even more so than a low resolution camera uh, or film. So that's why uh, when you put on a vintage lens, sometimes they may seem to be inferior to a modern lens. And when, when I think inferior is the wrong word, I think the correct word is they have a very different character than a modern lens. Modern lenses are very technically accurate and, and trying to produce a sharp image from edge to edge. Uh, without any vignetting, without any chromatic aberration, you know, purple fringing, etc. And the uh, the vintage lenses, they don't have any of that going for it, right? They have the, we're relying straight on what the optical image coming through that uh, lens is. And the fact that we have a very fine pixel pitch also picks up those imperfections, particularly like purple fringing, uh, and and. Even at a subtle level, level, if you can't see the purple fringing, we're going to pick up that that it's going to be perceived as less sharp or less contrasty when those imperfections are not corrected in the camera. But that all said, you know, vintage lenses can be a lot of fun and and great and produce terrific images, even if they'll never be quite appear as quite as sharp. Uh, in many cases, particularly like the vintage zoom lenses, just avoid those completely. Vintage zoom lenses, they suck. And there are one or two exceptions to that, right? Can't remember which ones they are. But if you see a vintage zoom lens and, and it's kind of expensive, uh, that's because it's one of those exceptions that, that were very good. Because most vintage zoom lenses you can buy for like five or ten dollars. <laughs> and most of the vintage primes when they start getting up to $50, $100, $200, you know those are the good ones. If you see a vintage prime lens that costs like $10 or $15, uh, you probably want to avoid it. Because right now the market is pretty much built into the price. And you can tell by the price which vintage lenses are good and which ones are bad. Okay, uh, let's see. Yeah, I, speaking of vintage lenses, I do use uh, not just Nikon vintage lenses, but also Olympus uh, Zwicko lenses. Those are very sharp. Once you stop them down to about f4, they're amazing. Um, because Arthur was saying he used his old Russian lenses and he's gotten really good good results with the Leica mount. And that that's cool because the Leica M mounts are very small flange distance. So they're not sticking way out like, you know. Um, my God, where is one? Uh, 
Ouch. <laughs> but yeah, here's 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 my 135 F3.5 with the uh, Micro Four Thirds adapter on there. Uh, this is what I like to use time to time. And then this is the uh, this is my Zuiko vintage lens. And what I like about the Zuikos is they're very compact lenses. And very sharp, just as sharp as uh, any modern lens I've ever used, to be honest, that I can tell. I have a, I have a vlog where I was imitating Kodachrome uh, 64 with my Pen F and I used this exact lens. So you can look at the images from that. Um, <laughs> Purple fringing on a 300 millimeter Olympus film lens. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Um, Brent, Brent has used the, the 300 millimeter uh, Zuiko lens, right? Prime, but he, he got a lot of purple fringing. Um, if I remember that lens, it didn't have a lot of elements for that to do the correction. Uh, for purple fringing, so you get a lot more character out of the lens, I think. But then, um, yeah, it doesn't it doesn't have lenses to correct for purple fringing and other defects that might be you know that happen when you do lens designs. The fifty millimeter FD one four. Oh, Fung Himan is saying that the you're only using one quarter of the image circle of a full frame lens, so you're quadrupling the already already rather high pixel pitch. Um, I guess that's one way of looking at it. It's one way or the other, right? Either the pixel pitch is high on the sensor because the sensor's cropped, or you have a bigger image circle. <laughs> uh, I think six and one half the other. I don't think you you double those two things though. It's not. I, I don't think using a crop sensor lens, say a DX lens, would be any different. Yeah, Logan is Logan is uh, saying that the 20 megapixel four thirds sensor is equivalent to 80 megapixel full frame, for instance, in pixel density. So, I assume that math is correct. It sounds right. I I don't know exactly, but uh, yeah, the pixel density of our sensors, because there there's a you can go online. There's some database that tells you the pixel density of different uh, uh, sensors or the pixel pitch, and um, you'll see that the pixel pitch between our cameras and some very high resolution full frame sensors are the same. And they would have the same issues with a vintage lens as, as our cameras. Um, any thoughts on the longest focal length that you're comfortable to hand hold at one or two seconds? Ah, uh, wow. I would, I probably wouldn't go much higher than 25 millimeters on, and I'm talking about micro four thirds, 25 millimeter lens. That's about the best I can do on the EM5 Mark III. On the Pen F, uh, Maybe EM1 Mark II, yeah, all all of them. I'm pretty comfortable at one or two seconds. If I'm if I'm doing everything right, you know, three point contact, you know, handheld, leaning up against the wall. If I do everything, I can get one or two seconds pretty consistently. If I'm just hand holding with one hand like this, out. Um, honestly, I'm at about one twentieth of a second handheld but if i can if i can lock my shoulders and 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 head forehead and nose and lean up against the wall one or two seconds no problem 
Uh, on the M5 Mark III, I've gotten six seconds handheld uh, with no tripod. But you know, at that point, you know, your whole body and, and the wall all become a tripod, really. If you're talking about handheld like this, uh, I have to be at one twentieth of a second regardless of the focal length. I, I just can't, I can't handhold better than that. Um, let's see, hopefully I'm, I'm trying to catch up here. Robin, you're being very gracious to help my, uh, the, the viewers here in the chat. I appreciate that. Uh, Yeah, Thomas, Tony and uh, an angry photographer, the, you know, the, yeah, I don't think either one is really wrong. It's just how it's presented, you know? I mean, Tony's right in that full frame lenses can, I mean, vintage lenses can be, uh, may not look as good on our digital cameras, but he doesn't really explain why. He just, he kind of implies that the lenses are inferior. And, you know, Ken Wheeler over there is saying, it, you know, that vintage lenses are, or, you know, older lenses, full-frame lenses are just as good as the modern lenses, if not better, for other reasons. Uh, but he, he tries to explain, he, he's, he argues more, I think, on the point about, you know, a crop is a crop is a crop or whatever, you know, that he goes into. And he's right. I mean, it doesn't matter what size the sensor is, you know, the output from the lens is exactly the same. And I, I would say Ken Wheeler is, is a little bit more accurate or not, not accurate. Let me say this. Ken Wheeler is a little more precise in his explanations than Tony Northrup. I'm not saying either one is right or wrong. I'm just saying Ken is a little bit more precise, whereas is Tony, he's more observational, right? He will take a picture with these settings or this lens and then take another picture with this setting and that lens and then say, okay, this one is not as good as this one. Uh, whereas you know, but not really be as precise or have that precision of what the diff why the differences are what they are. And I think uh, Ken Wheeler is a little bit more precise. He'll either talk about, you know, the crop size doesn't matter. It's about, you know, the uh, exposure is based per square inch or per millimeter. You know, I haven't, I haven't really watched his videos lately, but uh, that's that's about all I can say about that is it's it's a matter of how they communicate and that's why that's why having all these different channels is 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 really good the more choice we have in terms of who we can watch the better because we can they you know they communicate better to some people than others right so i you know it, it's best to look at all of them as you know time to time check out other channels uh and see who you can connect with better or get a different perspective um but anyway, I don't know where I was going with that. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I think about those those two channels. Is there's I think a little more precision with with Ken. Don't drink too much coffee. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I heard the GX80 does in-body defringing. That would help with vintage lenses. I don't. I don't think Moon Pond that that it does. But you know who can answer that is Maddie Solanto. If if the Panasonics have in-body defringing, defringing is, I thought, more of a lens profile uh, correction than it is a generic profile to the image. But if it does that, maybe I'm not. I've never looked for because I normally shoot with 
the you know Olympus lenses on Olympus cameras so I've never really had to think about purple fringing and when I do shoot with vintage lenses I'm expecting it to fringe right and when it doesn't all the better but I didn't really pay attention if if one brand does a better job than another like tries to correct purple fringing outside of its own lens database but to the image in general Your enthusiasm in your videos is infectious. I assume you're talking about Robin because he is he is the happiest man on earth, I think. <laughs> He's always smiling and, and very enthusiastic. And yeah, that's why I love his channel. You know, he's just, uh, and he's been cranking them out lately too. Some really good videos. So yeah, definitely, definitely watch, you know, if you haven't watched his, his channel in a couple of weeks, man, you got a lot of catching up to do. He's done a lot of videos in the last couple of weeks. Most of us, you know, like me and Peter and Maddie and Red35, you know, all of us, I don't know, and whoever else, man, we've been kind of slacking video-wise, but Robin has not. He's been, he's been at it. <laughs> The Nikon 300mm f4 AIS. Yeah, I've heard good things about that lens. Oh, hey, Rick. How are you? <laughs> He's giving feedback. The vintage, the light transmission of a vintage lens is different when fitted to its original film camera versus when you use an adapter to fit it. Uh, I'm curious about that. I'm not, I don't doubt you, but I don't know why the light transmission would be different because basically on the micro four thirds or, you know, when you're adapting a lens, you're, you're, you're bringing the, uh, all you're doing is adding the flange distance to it, which would be the same on the, the native camera that it was made for. But that's 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 over my head a little bit about the optics of or design of cameras in general, right? Lenses and camera bodies. So there's there's something there that I'm not seeing. That's very possible. What? CWB is a what lens would you use for active butterflies and flowers in an open garden? Uh, I would use the 75 to 300. Uh, that way you don't have to get, because those butterflies, like birds, are very skittish. <laughs> so a 75 to 300 is perfect for that. Uh, assuming you're in good light, and, and, you know, butterflies generally only come out when there's good light. <laughs> That's why butterflies are like, I think an easy target for photography is that you only see them when the weather's awesome. But I've taken a lot of butterfly pictures and I always use the 75 to 300. Um, I think, you know, because you don't know where they are, they're always moving, right? So I can zoom in and out very quickly and, and capture them. Uh, Yeah, this, the 40 to 150 with a 2x teleconverter would be awesome. Uh, the 40 to 150 Pro lens. But even the 40 to 150 kit lens is pretty awesome for, for butterflies too. I mean, it just depends how close you can get. If you can get really close to one, uh, you know, 25 millimeter prime would be best. But generally, you can't get too close to butterflies. So 75 to 300 for me. 40 to 150 maybe. But if it's the 40 to 150 Pro with a 2x tally converter, that's an awesome combo. You'll get tack sharp images that way. If you want to get serious about butterfly picks, yeah.
<laughs> Calm Rob and Enthusiastic Robin. <laughs> I guess just like our pictures, right? We need balance. <laughs> Yeah, I heard the Canon vintage glass, like from the 70s and 80s, is excellent. I just don't own any, to tell you, personally. I, I found uh, most most vintage primes are, are excellent. You know, I, like the Nikon 50 F1.4 and the F1.8. You have to stop them down a little to get them tack sharp, but that's true of any lens. I shoot Olympus lenses on a GX8 regularly, and and not on the Panasonic. Does not apply to Olympus lens profiles. It depends on the lens rather than the camera. Okay. I shoot Olympus lens on GX8. Yeah, I mean, yeah, all lenses have have defects at different degrees. Like I said, like with purple fringing, some lenses are going to be less prone to that than others. But I, I haven't, I haven't owned both systems long enough. I, I, I should say I haven't owned the Panasonic long enough to get a feel for uh, how different lenses perform on it versus on our Olympus cameras. I can only speak from. Uh, from what I've read, right? How much weight CWB is, how much weight should one give the DxO's megapixel ratings? I wouldn't, okay, I don't think the, okay, so DxO Mark is like a website and they have something called, uh, virtual megapixels or perceptual megapixel ratings for various lenses and understand that they're in a lab and they have a very good description of how they come up with those numbers and i think it's essentially they 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 uh they print to an 8 by 10 or they look at a standard 1080p monitor i forget the specs of how they come up with their metrics on how they measure the perceptual megapixels of the you know how much a lens can resolve um there's some methodology that they have and i i, I use that their database as a reference with no I, I try not to correlate what they say this lens you know if you put this lens on a 20 megapixel image on say the em1 mark ii is 20 megapixels and you put the 75 millimeter lens on there you're going to get roughly 12 to 14 megapixels of resolution out of that lens on the EM1 Mark II. And then if you put that same lens on, say, the EM10 Mark II, you're going to get, say, 9 megapixels resolution out of it. Uh, you know, and some lenses better or for worse. That, that final number that they come up with, I don't put a lot of weight in that number, okay? But I do use that site as a baseline because they're using the same testing methodology across cameras and across lenses. And that in of itself to me is very valuable when you have that consistency. So when they say that, you know, lens A is sharper than lens B at the same focal length, uh, I would say that's probably true. Uh, how much sharper it is, I wouldn't put a lot of stock in. Like if they say this lens is 12 megapixels and when you put this lens on with the same focal length, it's only 10 megapixels or 8 megapixels, you know, some number substantially lower, 10, 20% lower. I don't think in real life that it's actually 20% less sharp than this lens. Uh, you know, it might be. But I wouldn't rely on DxO Mark's uh, numbers to say that this lens is 20% less sharp than this lens. I will give them 
I will say that if they say this lens is less sharp than that lens, I will say that is probably true. But I won't say that if they say it's 20% less sharp, I won't say that it's 20% less sharp. I, I don't think that's a true statement or you shouldn't take that as a uh, hard number, right? It's not that it's false. It's just not a hard number uh, because of the way that they do their testing and their methodology. So I take I take their methodology, I, you know, I applaud that for the consistency from one camera and one lens to the next, but not for the actual differences. Uh, because in, in the example I can give is my kit lens, 14 to 42 kit lens, I find, you know, I don't find that lens one third as sharp as my 45 millimeter prime. But when you look at DxO mark, they'll say like the kit lens is a five megapixel. They'll say that the 45 millimeter uh, is ten, you know, giving you 10 megapixels, and the 75 millimeter is giving me 15 megapixels. I can't, I can't see that myself. You know, I don't see one lens half as sharp as another based on their scores. Uh, and that, and that's just my personal experience. But I think, I think it's, it's a good measure of. They're also very good at uh, telling you what parts of the lens are sharper than others. So when you go through the different f-stops on the lens, they'll say that. This lens is, particularly zoom lenses, right? They'll say that this lens is very sharp from wide open to about halfway. And then from halfway up to the end, you know, you need to be at F8 to get the sharpest results, but it's it's only going to be half as sharp as it was when it was wide open. So those kind of things, I think, have some value because their testing methodology is very consistent. So that and anyway, that's what I think of DxO and their ratings is the consistency is what's important there. The actual uh, precision or accuracy, I'd say, is another another question. Uh, M43 cropping means that you're not using the full width of the optics of the vintage lens. If you use the laser beam, it follow a different life path through the lens to the film's versus sensor. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I. It's a little beyond me, Rick. <laughs> to be honest, those those kinds of technical details about using full frame lenses on a crop sensor. Um, the full width of the optics of a vintage lens. Yeah, I I don't know. I I haven't um I don't know. It's not it's not a it's not a conversation I can participate in because it's all way beyond me. You know, for me, I just put the lens on the camera and and, and see what what kind of images I get. <laughs> uh and image ultimate image quality in of itself is not my goal. Uh because I'm not in that kind of photography, uh, like product photography, where it's very critical. Every freaking detail and, and color is accurate. If we're adapting vintage lenses or we're just going out and shooting, we're just having fun, right? Enjoying our hobby. Anyway, uh, and I don't know if you were here earlier, Rick, when I talked about this. Bad, I, was this the brand? That that you are saying you are having good luck with this new Oma, new Mono, new new Manoa. <laughs> anyway, manure. Uh, I did test this battery, and I got about seven hundred and something milliamps out of it. Um, so yeah, I'm not getting the full twelve hundred milliamps that the that this thing says it does. Um, but er, I talked about it earlier in the, in the live stream. Uh, let's see. A single DxO rating itself doesn't mean anything. The raw data behind it does. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, 
and that's that's true for everything, right? It's like if you have a rating, well, what's it com compared to what, right? You always need to compare things. So um, that's what I mean, that, that, that they do things consistently across lenses and cameras, you know, has a lot of value in of it, in of itself, regardless of the final number that they, they generate. That I don't put a lot of stock in that, that, that precision of that final number, but I do put a lot of stock in when they say one is better than the other because they did that comparison in a very consistent scientific way, I suppose. All noobs worship at the altar of DX. I, I hope not. <laughs> All noobs worship the altar of DXO mark. I, I certainly hope not. I think they should use it as a guide. I used to use it a lot to look at the measurements of the lenses when I was buying a lot of Nikon stuff. But ever since uh, I went to Micro Four Thirds, I, I rarely go to that site anymore. I use just the standard Micro Four Thirds uh, lens site that did, gives me the dimensions and sp specs that I need to know. Uh, mainly because all of the lenses that Panasonic and Olympus produce are very sharp. And uh, I focus more on the focal length that I need, more so than is this, is this lens sharper than the other. Um, so the only thing DxO really did for me in the past was really was give me the weight of the lens, the dimensions of the lens, the ring filter size. It had a lot of that in their database that I found very useful. But I, I wouldn't rely on their, their uh, some of the other aspects of their site. Okay, uh, we're, it's almost 1230, so that means it's been three hours and Believe it or not, I'm on the same battery on the CM1 Mark II, and it's, it's probably going to die any second. <laughs> but the M1 Mark II battery is amazing. Uh, I mean, we're a solid three hours here, and yeah, it's blinking red. So I'm, I'm going to have to stop, stop here. Uh, so we'll end it here, but again, thanks everybody for coming in and joining me and uh robin thanks for coming in and helping out some of the uh the participants here so uh look for next sunday as usual and if i can get one in between maybe uh but look for january 16th for the collaboration live stream at 3 45 eastern daylight time uh, between me robin and peter forsgaard so you guys, uh, thanks again for joining and Happy New Year and uh, we'll see you again soon.